Hello and welcome to the second video in a series on Chapter 11 of Government in America about Congress. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about how Congress is structured, uh, and each chamber is set up a little bit differently. Uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, the Speaker of the House, who is mentioned in the Constitution, uh, is the ultimate leader and, and has the real power. Uh, in the House of Representatives to set the agenda, decide what bills are going to be put up and not, so on and so forth. Um, the Speaker uh, is assisted by a majority leader and majority whips who help try and organize things and make sure that the Speaker has the votes for whatever the Speaker uh, wants to pass. Um, and then uh, the mechanism through which the speaker and the leadership will often set those situations up is a uh, committee in the House called the Rules Committee, which will set procedures for particular bills to say, okay, we'll have this much debate on this bill, we'll allow this many amendments to that bill, and here's how it's going to go. Um, so that's kind of the power structure in the House. In the Senate, we know that the vice president is technically the president of the Senate, and we know that uh, the president pro tempore is set up to preside over the Senate when the vice president is not able to. But those are mainly ceremonial roles, except for the vice president's ability to um, break ties uh, in the Senate. The real leadership power in the Senate is in the majority leader, the person who is elected by whichever party controls more seats to kind of be the head of their group. And then the majority leader has whips who are supposed to help. Um, a whip in legislative terms is somebody whose job is to go around and count up how many people are on each side of an issue and encourage uh, people who are against the leadership to be for the leadership. Um, their job is to think of it however you want. They whip up the vote, they whip people into line, however you want to uh, use the metaphor, go with it. But the whip's job is to help the leadership count and get the votes that the leadership needs. Okay? So the majority leader has the bulk of the power uh, and can set the procedures for debating and voting on bills based on rules that are already standing and already accepted in the Senate, which some of which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, when we do the video that focuses specifically on the Senate. Um, often the minority leader uh, will have some input on this, but ultimately it's the majority leader in the Senate who's really able to call the shots for the most part. Now, each chamber is broken down into a number of standing committees uh, which focus on specific topics and um, the leader of the chamber um, you know has a lot of influence over who's on which committees uh, and uh, which committees will actually look at a bill um, so uh, you know whenever you're looking at what the House or the Senate are doing, you want to look at what's going on in the committees and what are the committee's relationships with the leadership. Now, the House and the Senate do not have exactly the same committees. They're, they each have the ability to set up their own committees and to break up topics and subject matters how they see fit. So, for example, the House has a committee on ways and means, which is about well, how are we going to raise money, and then how will we spend it? Um, a lot of that same subject matter is handled by the Senate Finance Committee. The House has a committee on education and the workforce. Um, when Democrats are in control of the chamber, they call this the Education and Labor Committee. When Republicans are in control, as they are now, they call it the Education and Workforce Committee. The corresponding committee on the Senate side is the Committee for Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, which, if you look at it, um, makes the nice acronym HELP, 
and all of those things, health, education, labor, and pensions, are things that are supposed to help the people. So, you know, if you're ever looking for a mnemonic device on how to remember what's in that committee, there you go. Help. Um, or if you were ever figuring out which Beatles song people in the Senate like most, I guess now you know. So, the standing committees have a lot of uh, influence over how laws ultimately get constructed and put together, and uh, ultimately they're going to have to decide whether or not to report a bill to the full chamber. So a bill will get argued about, discussed, amended within the committee, right? And these are the people who have spent the most time on this topic. So normally they're going to be the most critical of what's going on. And then once they've all gone over it, then they'll see if they have a version that they're happy to send to the entire House or to the entire Senate. And if they don't, then a bill won't get anywhere. So that's why committees are so important. Um, committees also uh, have an oversight responsibility. So when they're not making laws, they can be holding hearings and asking people to come in and testify about different topics. How is this law working? How bad is this problem in the United States? Uh, what would happen if we did such and such? Okay. So these hearings, these oversight issues, can bring attention to an issue and provide ideas for future legislation. They're also a way that the legislative branch can exercise some checking and balancing of the executive branch by calling in people from the executive branch to testify uh, on what's going on and why things are being done the way they are, and, you know, to try and trip them up. So when one party controls the Congress and the other party controls the White House, the oversight committees, the oversight actions of the committees are a way that the Congress can kind of challenge and poke at the executive branch a little bit. Okay. Um, so those are some general details of uh, the, uh, the structure uh, of uh, the uh, of the House and the Senate. Let me uh, talk about another couple of uh, uh, terms that are important. Uh, one is who gets to be in charge of the committees, uh, the committee chairpersons. That's heavily influenced, but not completely, by seniority, the amount of time that a senator or representative has served in the House or the Senate. Uh, and in normal cases, that's continuous service. Uh, if people serve for a while, then they retire or they lose, and then they get reelected later, many times their seniority resets at zero. Um, so someone who's been in the same chamber for 20, 30, 40 years is going to have built up a lot of seniority and they'll have a chance to get onto a powerful committee and maybe even be in charge of it and have a lot of influence. Um, now, uh, over the last 10, 20 years, uh, the parties have tried to uh, make some changes in how seniority works. It's no longer automatic. It's not like, oh, well, you know, Bob was here longer than Mary, so Bob gets first pick. Um, the individual... Uh, groups in the House and the Senate might have a discussion and a vote. Uh, sometimes they create term limits and say you can only be on a certain, in charge of a certain committee for a certain period of time. So seniority is not a hard and fast rule anymore, but it still has a lot of influence. Um, we should also take a moment and think about a party caucus. We talked about caucus in elections. This is not quite the same. It is still the idea of a meeting of people who are affiliated or have a like mind. Um, but in this case, the caucus is sort of an organization uh, normally of people who are in the same party. All right? uh, parties are not officially mentioned in the Constitution. The Constitution did not set up a party system. It just happened anyway. And at this point, they are pretty vital to how both the House and the Senate get organized. Because before the House gets together to pick the Speaker of the House, first all the Republicans 
organized to see who their leader is going to be. And all the Democrats get together to figure out who their leader is going to be. And then whichever caucus, whichever group is larger, well, they're the ones that tend to get to pick their leader to be the Speaker of the House, which is what the Republicans have done since um, the 2010 House election. Uh, and so the parties choose the leader, and then the leaders make a lot of the decisions about what's going to happen in the chamber. The last thing that I want to talk about in this video is kind of skipping ahead a little bit if you're following along in the chapter, but um, uh, I wanted to bring it up here, and I think just time-wise, this is uh, where I can get it in best. Um, and that is the question about what is the role of someone in Congress? Um, is the person that we elect someone that we're choosing and we want them to do what they think is best, independent of what the voters want? Or are we expecting the person that we elect to just go in and basically do whatever the majority of the people in the district want. Um, and so this is a debate that has gone on in democratic circles and political science circles and whatnot uh, for a very long time. And uh, the terminology involved uh, is sort of the trustee versus delegate model. If you believe in the trustee del uh, model, then you believe that the voters have trusted the senator or trusted the congressman or congresswoman and want that person to use their knowledge, their expertise, their judgment, and make good decisions. And then we'll come back and we'll evaluate your decisions at the next election and see if we're still happy with them and we still trust you. Whereas the delegate point of view basically says, your job is not to think about this stuff yourself. Your job is to take our wishes and manifest them on the floor of the House or Senate with a vote. And so if you think we're all wrong, so what? Suck it up. Go vote the way we want you to. Um, now, in my experience, I don't know of anybody who really thinks 100% of the trustee model and one or 100% of the delegate model. Um, but there are certainly people who lean more in one direction or another. Uh, and that's why uh, that model can be useful. All right, so that'll conclude this video. In the next, we'll talk more de in detail about how bills become laws. But until then, I will leave you with these questions for thought and discussion.